Okay, now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Nolan. Hi, my name is Nolan. I'm an addict alcoholic. And I'm not from Pasadena. <laughs> I'm the worst. So I'm from Sherman Oaks. That's where I'm living at right now. It's a step down from Pasadena. Uh, and one of the things I learned around this program is never to say never. And I always said that I would never live in the valley, uh, San Fernando Valley. And, and uh, now that never has been became a reality. I lived there. Uh, hope not for long. I, uh, these are not the clothes I wore when I was drinking. <laughs> uh, you know, when I'm sitting down there, and I'm, you know, before I come up here, I, uh, some people have, if I'm nervous, and I, I don't know, I, I never think about being nervous. What I, what I think about is that, see, there's a part of me that really needs to look good. And, and when I, when I'm sitting there, I, I keep asking God to please let me come out of my head and come from my heart. And, and sometimes it takes five minutes, and sometimes I can't get out of my head, you know, and I, but I try hard to get out of there. When I come from my head, I'm just, it's a lot of rhetoric. And, uh, and that comes, like I said, that comes from trying to look good, because see, all my life, there was a need for me to look good, because I never felt good, so I always had to look good, you know, I tried to look good. And, it, and it's still with me after all the years I've been around this place. And uh, so hopefully that uh, uh, God will answer my prayers that I, that I will come out of my head. One of the things I was thinking is that, well, let me get it over quickly, that uh, I used for 22 years and I, uh, uh, and I did whatever it took for me to get loaded. You know, that's what my primary purpose was every day, to get loaded. Uh, and whatever it took me to, to get loaded, sometime it took me uh, to jails and institutions and, and uh, penitentiaries. And I hope I don't have to talk anymore. That's my qualification about uh, what happened. Because I feel that it's easy to get on a, front, in a, on a podium and talk about uh, how I drank or how I used, uh, how I walked penitentiary yards. I, I feel that uh, after being around for a long time, I feel like talking about that stuff is just bragging. Uh, we get up here sometime and talk about how much we drank and how much we used and, and what places it took us. And, and basically, we all, it doesn't matter how much you drank or how much you used or what places it took you. You know, it, it got you here. You know, this was the end. And, uh, and that's what happened for me. It got me here. And what I try to do today is I try to remember, uh, the things that, that caused me a lot of pain and, and a lot of agony and, and, and caused a lot of other people a lot of pain and agony. The things that I don't like to talk about that I like to share with you, the things that I'm not proud of and the things that I've been ashamed of, the things I like to share tonight. And uh, I remember when I did my first inventory, I, uh, or even my last inventories, I, I, I don't remember too much about what happened uh, before I started using. Somehow I have a great mental block against finding out what it used to be like before I started using it. And every so often I would get a glimpse of something that happened uh, prior to my using. Because uh, I guess we all like to think that we had a great childhood and, and, and I would like to feel that I had a great childhood. I would like to feel that, I, that my mom did the best that she could with the tools that she had. And, uh, and, uh, and it's like, so I blocked out a lot of things. And every so often something will come up, you know, and and what I'm finding out is, is because some of the things that have came up in the last few years, uh, what I'm finding out is that I have a way of destroying everything that makes me happy. You know, I can break things immediately. Something that's going to make me happy when, my, and when I'm hurting and I get angry, the first thing I will strike out at is whatever thing that I, it could be a thing or a person, you know. It, I don't know how many people have ever done that, but I do that a lot. You know. uh, so maybe what I should share is, is one of the things that I remembered this year. This came this this year. I started remembering some of the things that when I was a kid. You know, when I was about uh, 12 years old, I uh, 
I don't know if it was 12, I'm just using the number 12 because I don't remember. I, I know I was a real young kid. Because every summer I used to go to Battle Creek, Michigan. See, I was born and raised in Chicago, and I had an aunt and uncle that lived in Battle Creek, and, and, uh, and my mom used to send me there by train, and I'd spend the, I'd spend the summer there. And, and my aunt and uncle, they had four children, and, and they owned a home that it was like a private resort. You know, they uh, lived up on the hill, and there was a private beach, and there was about maybe a dozen homes in that area. And, uh, and I used to go there, and they, I used to learn how to fish and uh, go swimming a lot and you know, go hiking. and I did a lot of things that I couldn't do when I was living back in Chicago. And I remember one summer I went out there, and there was a brand new family there, and there was a girl with that family. She must have been about 18 or 19 years old. And, and I can remember the first time I saw her, I fell in love. You know, and and, I, and I, I used to sit up on top of the hill and wait for her to come out in the morning. And when she came out, I used to run down the hill and I used to tag along with her. And, and like if she went swimming, I went swimming. If she went to the mailbox, I went to the mailbox. If she went to the store, I went to the store. You know, wherever she went. And when I was with her, man, I, I mean, I was so excited all the time. My heart used to just pound a lot. And, you know, and it was just, I just wanted to be with her. And I didn't know anything about sex or anything like that. Is all I know is that, that I fell in love and I didn't know what love was, but it was a feeling that I had for this girl. And, and I can remember just tagging along with her. I was like her little puppy dog, and uh, a couple of weeks went by, and finally we're uh, we're up at my aunt's place. My aunt had one of these swings up in the yard there, and it was evening, and I don't know where my cousins were. My aunt and uncle were in the house, and her and I were sitting on the swing, and uh, boy, and I was just sitting there with her, and just got uh, the stars were out, and, and uh, uh, boy, I'm telling you, I, I, it, the feeling that I had was fantastic until she said what she said. And what she had proceeded to tell me, and I don't remember the exact words that she had told me, but I realized what she did tell me is that, Nolan, you're barking up the wrong tree. <laughs> and it took her about five or ten minutes to tell me this. And as she was talking to me and telling me this, and I knew that, that it was over between her and I. And she... <laughs> I can laugh about it now, but at that time, at that time, it was very painful. Let me tell you, you know what? It's really funny. I, I get a kick out of it. And I used to say to other people, you know, other kids, man, this puppy love. You don't know what it is, you know. But you know what? I had a lot of feelings going. And then when she told me that I was barking up the wrong tree, I mean, it was a lot of pain. And I remember I was sitting there in that, in that swing, and, and she was trying to be as kind as she could. And uh, when she got finished, she got up from the swing and and she started to leave and she walked about five foot. She stopped, she turned around, she said to me, No, are you gonna be all right? And I'm sitting there trying to look like everything's fine, you know. And I said, Yeah, everything's gonna be all right. I'm all right. You know, like I didn't I wanna make her feel that I didn't really care one way or the other, but but the truth was I hurt so bad that I couldn't get up from that swing after she left. I watched her walk down the hill. And not only was I in a lot of emotional pain, I started getting into physical pain. You know, I, I didn't want to cry. And I can remember my throat getting real sore that night. I mean, I was just sitting there. And I knew if I got off that bench and made any moves, I would break down. And I sat on that bench, I mean, on that swing, till I got some kind of relief. And I remember how you just take it. Somebody mentioned, one of, the, one of the birthday people mentioned about the stuffing. You know, and I just took that feeling. I kept stuffing it down, you know. And I... And I couldn't get off that, that swing till I knew it wouldn't come up. And then when I got off the swing, I went into the house and I, you know, and I pretended everything was all right. And I started to realize uh, when that came up, I must have done that a lot in my life. You know, every time something went wrong, and any time I caused any pain. See, what happened was that I, did, I couldn't tell my cousins that I was hurting. They were all younger than I was. And I... And I didn't know it was okay to go to my aunt and uncle and tell them how I felt. So what I learned, the lesson that I learned is that what I do from then on, anybody that hurts me, you will never know. Yeah, from that point on, I never let people know if you hurt me. And what I did every time you did, I made everything, made it off everything was okay, and I took it and I stuffed it. So by the time I was 15 years old, or 16 when I started drinking, was that... Uh, I learned how to stuff, and, I, and, and what it was is I, 
that were talking about looking good. I, I was looking good on the outside. I don't know, maybe I wasn't, maybe I thought I was. Uh, looking good on the outside, but my insides, I walked around with my insides always in a knot. You know, I got to the point in my life where what I really wanted from people was I wanted you to love me. And I wanted to love you. But see, I wasn't scared to let you that close to me. So what I started to do was that anytime anybody got close to me, I started pushing you away. And, and the paradox was that I wanted you there, and I was afraid to let you in. So I've walked around for a lot of years with this with this knot in my gut, and uh, and I hurt, you know. And, and sixteen year old kids hurt, fifteen year old kids hurt. And I remember the first time I got loaded, and it's, it really doesn't matter what you got loaded on. Let me get rid of this gum. Uh, really doesn't matter what you got loaded on. It's just the fact that that I can remember I got loaded and and uh, and that knot untied. And for the first time in my life, I, you know, like I didn't care if you, if you hurt me. Now I didn't, you know, you get to that point the first time you get loaded. I didn't care if you were smarter than I was. I didn't care if you played baseball better than me. I didn't care if you talked better than I did. I didn't care if you looked better than I did. For the first time in my life, I felt a little bit of peace. You know, because at the age of 16 years old, I really felt that I couldn't function out there in society anymore. Not the way I felt. And the only way I was able to function out there was by getting loaded. That was the first time in my life I felt at, at peace with myself. And, and, and so what I did for the next 22 years is I chased that feeling the first time I got loaded. I don't know when it stopped working or when it worked or when it didn't work. I know that, that I dedicated the rest of my life just getting loaded. And, and what happened during that time is that, that I learned to lie. And, and and I don't mean the kind of lies that I told you. That that may be a little bit important today, but it wasn't. You know, to me, it, that's secondary. My lies to you. What's what's more important is the lies I started telling me. You know, when when you walk around like I did for so many years and couldn't function, you pretended that you function. You know, you go into a world of fantasy. You, you, you tell yourself all the time that things are okay, and you start identifying feelings like, okay, you know, feelings that you start identifying. If you're feeling lonely, you don't identify it as loneliness. You identify it as something else. You know, when you're afraid and you're a man, knowing the world, you don't identify that feeling of fear. So I even start lying about the type of feelings I was having. You know. And uh, so by the time I got here, you know, not only I was an alcoholic and an addict, but I was a, a proficient liar. You know, I didn't know who I was. You know, I really did not know who I was. And, uh, you know, I, a little bit about the, the fear aspect is that, uh, you know, the way I tied that up, I, I, the kind of person that I was is that I'm either in it's like I'm a pendulum. I, there's no moderation for me. I'm either overconfident or I'm in, in, in stark raving terror. One of the two. You know. <laughs> no, it's like when you use it, you, you, you want you're, you're a dream, you know, like most of us are dreamers. You know, and it's like we dream a lot. You know, we were, we dream about what it used to be like. We tell ourselves <laughs> lies about what it. You know, it that was fine. We did great, and we talk about all the great things that we're going to do in the future. And, and so what happened is like uh, one of my dreams was that uh, one day I would wake up and I would be a, uh, a skier. This is just one of many dreams, you know. And, and what, but my dreams were really, really good because I'd have certain uniforms and you know. Uh, I remember the, 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 the ski story was that the, the uniform was black because the black represents a lot of machoism, you know. And, and when you don't feel machoism, you want to. You want to look like it's macho on the outside, and you have a black one in, and yellow stripes down the side, not the back, but down the side. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and a nice looking pair of boots and skis, and, and, a, and a, black, a black beanie with a yellow button on top, you know, with the yellow goggles. You know, and one day they're just standing there. You know, you get out of bed, you jump into them, and you, you go to the ski slope, and they, 
you got a number on the front, number on the back, and you stand there, and, 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 and you come out of the chute, and there's people lined up up and down the up and down the mountain just cheering your name. Hey, no! And you, know, you, 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 you go all the way through there, you know. And, uh, Cause you, you know, cause it got to a point, you know, when you watch TV, you know, like that was Billy Kidd. He was the only American skier that I remember at that time. So I wanted to be a Billy Kidd. I always wanted to be somebody else, rather than be a Nolan. You know, so I had this once. One of these dreams was a skiing thing. And I remember when I got clean and sober. Uh, one thing I realized when I got clean and sober, I was not a doer. I was a dreamer. So what I did is I start picking people out in the program who are doers. And I'd hang around with them because, see, I usually am attracted to other dreamers. And you stand around and you just dream a lot, you know. And, <laughs> so I, yeah, and, and just dream, I had to get loaded behind that all the time. So I started hanging around with doers, and they went to the mountains every year. And I said, God, I don't learn how to ski. Yeah. And I remember we went up there the first year, and uh, the only thing I really did the first year was I uh, threw snowballs and I... Uh, Played some poker and I <laughs> stood in front of the fire and told her how wonderful things were. And, and then we came down and I didn't learn how to ski. So the second year we went up there, the only thing that I did different the second year is that uh, we rented inner tubes and we came down the sides of the mountain. <laughs> and, and then the third year, you know, I went up there and, and, I'm, and I'm sitting there with these Levi's on and uh, I had a blue turtleneck sweater. And, I always dressed nice, you know, I want to always look good, you know, and I had these my cowboy boots on, and, and, uh, and I had them off, and I had them sitting right next to me, and I was on this chair and fire, you know, just in the lodge, and just looking good, and uh, <laughs> uh, finally, finally someone called to me and said, Nolan, how about going skiing? And I, you know, I went, this is the third year, and it's the first time somebody asked me to go skiing, you know. <laughs> I start realizing there was a lot of me up there. You know, and I didn't know how to do it. And finally, we brought a skier up there. And, uh, <laughs> and, I, and I looked at Carl, and I said, well, Carl, I says, uh, I, says I don't know how to ski. <laughs> I didn't want too many people to hear that. <laughs> and uh, he says, well, let's go, let's, let's go learn. And I said, God, that sounds like a good idea. Uh -huh. you know, we'll do it tomorrow. <laughs> First, first thing in the morning, he said, now let's go do it now. And when he said, let's go do it now, I felt, I felt pretty comfortable with that. Somebody was going to take me. And if somebody was going to take me, I, I, I felt a little more courage behind that. And we went over the, 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 snow, the, the slopes, and, uh, and I, I, I didn't have this black outfit. I just had this blue <laughs> turtleneck sweater on, these blue jeans, and... and uh, <laughs> I rented some skis and I rented some poles and I rented some shoes and they put them on me and and thank God they put them on me. I still have a tr I still have trouble putting them on. Um, and I'm standing there and it started to snow a little bit. And Carl says to me, he says, "Look, no one. You see that little house over there?" I said, "Yeah. What about it?" He says, "Well, that's where you go." I said, "Well, where are you going?" He says, "Well, I'm going skiing." And I wanted to tell him, "Don't leave me, man." <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> I felt pretty comfortable with him there. I, 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 I had some support, and, and he turned around and he left me. And I'm telling you, I got terrified. Because, see, what I had to do now is to walk sideways with these skis over to that house and tell whoever's in that, behind that window that I didn't know how to ski. That scared me. Telling people I don't know how to do things terrified me. I don't know if you can identify, but I, I was really terrified. And, I, and it took me a while. I thought I had one of the, the fantasies that came to my head as I was slowly going over there, that three huge guys would come along, bump into me, we'd get into a fight, and they'd break my leg. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I wasn't scared of physical violence. I was afraid to tell people I didn't know how. I would rather get in a fight and get my leg broke. <laughs> yeah. But no three big guys come along, you know. <laughs> Not even three small guys that I could, <laughs> that I could pretend were big guys, you know. Uh, so I, I slowly went over, and there was people around the window. Now, I was not going to go to that window till everybody was gone. You know, so I slowly went over there. Finally, everybody left the window. 
And I went up to that window and I looked in there and there's this pretty little blonde standing there. You know, of all people I got to tell, I didn't know how to ski. And I asked her, I said, well, I, you know, and I go to a deeper voice because I don't want her to mistake me for a girl. <laughs> um, somehow in my head told me that women don't know how to do things. Men know how to do everything, you know. I mean, I lived in a fantasy land. And, uh, uh, and I asked her what lesson. Uh, she said, what lesson? I said, well, the first time I did it. So she said, all right, she appeared in $5. She gave me my slip. And then she tells me, she says, see them people over there, the people I've been trying to avoid? <laughs> I said, yeah. She said, well, go stand with them, and your instructor will come. Now, I go over there, and I'm standing with the rest of these people, and I'm thinking, my head starts telling me, Nolan, you are the only person here who truly does not know how to ski. That means you're the only one here that's going to make a real jerk out of himself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and, and it's cold and I'm sweating <laughs> and uh, finally the instructor comes and she happens to be one of them Scandinavian blondes you know <laughs> and uh, she takes us out for our first lesson and the only thing they teach you on the first lesson is is how to walk sideways up a mountain on skis and they also they, they tell you that you don't come straight down, that you go like this. And they teach you how to snow plow. That means your skis are like this. So you don't pick up too much speed. Now, that's all they teach you. And, and, and they give you a couple little short runs on hills about this high. You know, and not, and, and, but not, deep, not deep ones where you don't have too much problem in your learning. So when the, when the lesson was over, and I went from stark raving terror to overconfident. And Carl comes back, and I'm standing there, and he says, how did it go? I said, it was a piece of cake. <laughs> <laughs> and he says to me, well, he says, let's go ski. I said, let's go. <laughs> That's the alcoholic personality. You know, and... Uh, now we go over to the the, the, the lift, the ski lifts, and when we do, you, I don't know how many people are ever going to ski, but what happens is you go over there and, and you, you have to get in front of these chairs, and then these chairs come along and they hit you in the ass, and, and you sit down and they bring you up. Now, when you're standing down here looking up, it don't look far at all. <laughs> and you start getting halfway up there and you look down. And you, <laughs> And I, and I turned the car on. I said, you know what? I says, uh, I says, these ski lifts did not stop to pick us up. I said, how do we get off? He says, you jump. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, I, you know what a moment of clarity is? <laughs> moment of clarity comes to you and says, you do not belong on this ski lift. <laughs> You have no business up here, and 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 uh, but I'm up there, right? and and I and I know what I'm supposed to do now. What I'm supposed to do is just go straight up and come right back down in that seat, and let everybody in the world know that I didn't. But I wasn't going to do that. See, there's another fear that I have, and uh, and uh, the even larger fear than the one that I'm talking about. The other fear is I'm more afraid to let you know that I'm afraid. See, I'm going to get off that ski lift no matter what. If it kills me, I'll get off the damn ski lift. Yeah. And, uh, and then I prayed to God. I says, you know, I, I, somehow I got off the damn thing. And, and somehow I got down. And I, I mean, I prayed all the way down. And, uh, and I told God on the way down, if he gets me off that mountain, I will never go back up. <laughs> and, uh, it took me nine years to go back to that. <laughs> But my whole life is like that. You know, that's just just one of many, many stories and many, you know, and many dreams that I have never completed. I was too afraid to do things. You know, I, I'm still a dreamer. And I've been around this program, you know, a while now, and I'm still caught up into them dreams. And the reason for that is I'm scared to death to look bad, and I'm scared to death to fail. See, I I, I don't mind doing things that you ask me to do. 
you know, that I know that I could do because see, that'll make me look good. But I don't like to attempt things I don't know how to do. It just scares me. It scares me to look bad. And uh, but I'm learning and I'm growing. You know, that's one of my character defects. You know, and uh, uh, you know, we're talking about character defects. I maybe before I get too far and too long winded, I like to talk a little bit about uh, not only the feelings. So, but I brought that story up only to say that I identify my feelings. And I lied to myself about my feelings, and, uh, and 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 when I got here, I lied. I lied for the first three years when I got here, and uh, I lied about working the steps. See, when I got here, this was the only place in the world that I've ever been accepted for who I was—a drug addict, an alcoholic, a liar. Uh, and you, you know, the only place in the world that will accept you. There ain't no other place in the world. You know, don't even try to go someplace else. If you go someplace else and say, hey, I'm a drug addict and I'm an alcoholic and I'm a liar and I'm a convict, they won't let you in. <laughs> this is the only place in the world. You know? And that's good and bad because see, when I got here, you know, one of the things that I starved for all my life was, was, was love. You know? and, and, and that's why I was so lonely and I was in so much pain. See, I didn't come to this program to get clean and sober. I came here because I was in so much pain and I was so lonely and I was, you know, just, they had no place else to go. And you, know, you hear that a lot from the podium. I had no other place to go. You know? and, and I really, in the beginning, I didn't believe that. I thought it was good sounding from a podium. But what I realized is that that I really had no other place to go. People had quit inviting me to go places. And the reason why I got to this program is so somebody invited me to an AA meeting. And I said, sure, I'll go. Not because I wanted to go to an AA meeting to get clean and sober. It's just that I wanted to go any place. You know, and I came. And uh, you know, this one is that. But that was the positive. The great part is that I found Alcoholics Anonymous. The sad part was six months later, I buried the guy that brought me. He died from an overdose of heroin uh, six months later. But when I got here, what you did for me is you, you gave me all the things that I've been starving for. You let me, you, you let me come here. You let me stay. Uh, you told me you loved me. I remember my second meeting, there was a girl there that took a one-year cake. And, uh, and I had identified myself as a newcomer. And uh, and after the meeting, she came up to me. I wouldn't go up to her. You know, I was too proud and too too much into looking good. You know, I, uh, and I looked God, the way I looked when I got here. I can't believe I, I thought it looked good. But she came up to me and she said something to me that that probably saved my life. And she said to me, "No one," you know. And she gave me a hug. And I think she felt that the my need for love and my starvation for love. She said to me, no, no, you're probably incapable of loving yourself. Why don't you stick around this program and let us love you so you can learn to love yourself? Man, those were the greatest words that I've ever heard in my life. And that's probably why I stuck around. But I stuck around for a couple of years, and, and what I did, you know, I didn't work the steps and I didn't read the big book. And the reason why I didn't work the steps and I didn't read the big book is I couldn't buy the concept. I really didn't, couldn't buy the concept that, that by reading that book and, and working them steps can change my life. I mean, I was, I was the happiest I ever been in my life just going to AA meetings. I didn't think my life could be any better. I mean, I was just thrilled to death to come to meetings every night. I went every single night. I loved it. But what happened, me hanging around for a couple of years, I learned how to talk to talk. And I learned, I, I used to be, a, you know, they'd ask me to speak, and I, before I got finished talking, I would say, and for the newcomers, they got to work the steps. And I never worked them, but I knew. <laughs> I knew that was one of the things to say because other people from the podium said that. You know, so I learned how to say the things that you're supposed to say around this place. So what it was is I, I, I just, all I did was I came to this program and I took and I took and I took and I took and I took. You loved me and I let you and I, you loved me and I let you. And I wouldn't let you so close. And, and it was like what happened is I came here and I found the first plateau and I just got so comfortable up there. I didn't want to pick up no tools and, 
you know, and, and, I, and I didn't know I could go to another plateau. So about three years later, I was about three years sober when I had to get a new sponsor because my, my sponsor had moved uh, away. Uh, and I was at a meeting with my new sponsor, and he said to me, no, and he says, how about next week bring me an inventory? And I looked at Sam, and I said, well, Sam, I said, look, I've already done an inventory. And he said to me, look, he said, I don't remember asking you if you've done an inventory. What I, re what I remember asking you is to bring me an inventory. And he says, no one, look, he says, you don't have to bring me an inventory. But if you want me to be your sponsor, you do what I ask you to do. And if you don't want to bring me an inventory, find another sponsor. And thank God, the only positive thing about trying to look good all the time is that I, when you're trying to look good is that you want other people's approval. That's why you try to look good. And I needed Sam's approval. That was the only reason why I got into the steps. Not because I believed in them. Not that I thought that they could really help me. You know, or make some change in my life. I got into them because I wanted someone to validate me. It's the only reason. You know, and it's, I, I really, to this day, I don't believe, I don't care what your vehicle is, you ought to get into the steps. And, and, and what happened is that I needed Sam's approval. That was the only reason why I got into the steps. Not because I believed in them. Not that I thought that they could really help me. You know, or make some change in my life. I got into them because I wanted someone to validate me. It's the only reason. You know, and it's, I, I really, to this day, I don't believe, I don't care what your vehicle is, you ought to get into the steps. And, and, and what happened is that I went home and when he asked me to do the inventory, and I, and I remember I was up all night long and I wrote and I wrote and I wrote and I wrote and I wrote. And, I wrote. and pro, pro, when daybreak came, the only thing that I had was a whole floor full of paper, and I couldn't write an inventory. You know, every time I wrote something and I read it, and I read it, I know it wasn't true. See, I didn't even know how to—I didn't, I didn't know how to tell the truth. You know, and, and, and everything looked phony. You know, and and I, so I, I knew I couldn't do a fourth step. So what I did is the next day I got got in my car and I drove all the way out to where my first sponsor moved to and. And I went and saw him, and and, uh, and I, I remember sitting down with him we have, after we had dinner, and we were sitting and having coffee in this living room, and I said to him, I said, you know, Lou, I, I said, I'm, I'm, having a, I'm having trouble doing my inventory again. And Lou looked at me, and he says, uh, no one, uh, the only reason why you're having trouble doing your inventory again uh, is because you've never done an inventory. <laughs> and I thought he, I thought he, I thought he thought I did one. You know, I really did. And he said, and the reason why you're having a hard time doing your first inventory is because you haven't wor worked your third and your second step. He says, he's what kind of a guy you are is what we call two steppers around here. You come here and you admit that you're powerless over alcohol and drugs, and then you immediately jump to the the last half of the twelfth step, and you carry the message whatever message you carry, you know, and, uh, and that's what I did. I was a two-stepper for about three, three years, and, uh, uh, just like the first time you got loaded, you want to turn the whole world on, you know, and then when I found out called Synonymous, I wanted to turn the whole world on, and, and that's what I was doing, so I never truly got into the steps, so that day, that night, we just stayed up for a few hours, and we talked, and, uh, uh we talked about the second step, and, and, uh, I think that night I came to believe in the power greater than myself would restore me to sanity because I realized before I left Lou's house that, that I had done some insane things in my life. See, it was hard for me to identify as being insane. And I'm not insane, but I've done insane things. You know, there were, there were moments that I was insane. See, what, what, he, what, he, what he explained to me is that, you know, there's a norm in this world, and the norm is what most people do. See, what most people do, that's what we consider normal. And what we consider abnormal is what most people don't do. He says most people don't get drunk and get in fights. And most people don't break in people's homes. Most people 
don't let their kids grow without food. Yeah. Uh, those things you've done were insane. And, and I, so that night I came to believe that, that there's a chance for me to, to get some kind of sanity into my life. And, and the next night, you know, I, I guess when you become a student, uh, the teacher appears because the next night I went to a meeting and there was a guy by the name of Elton uh, who was speaking and his whole pitch was on the third step. Or maybe it wasn't, I just, that's probably what I had to hear and it sounded like this whole pitch was on the third step. And I cornered him after the meeting and he took me out for coffee and we went to a restaurant together and we talked and talked. And he asked me to come back to his house and we went back to his house. You know, and I was around the program over three years and I had no idea that there was a third step prayer. None. Because I never cracked the big book. And, uh, and I can remember we, we, he said, come on, let's go in my bedroom. And, and uh, I walked into the bedroom with, with him and he went to his bookshelf and he brought out the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. He laid it on the end of the bed and he got on his knees and he says, come on and join me. And I said, uh, uh, be in another man's bedroom and, and uh, you know I was, I was ashamed to kneel down behind closed doors I don't know I, I, I had a hard time with that you know, and, and the reason I guess I had a hard time with kneeling because it is a humbling position and being in a humbling position with another man it just didn't sound attractive to me you know <laughs> But I knew I had, you know, if I wanted, if I wanted Sam to like me, I had to do this. And I remember I knelt down, I knelt down next to uh, Elton, and and, uh, and he grabbed my hand, and we held hands, and I, oh, I'm telling you, I broke out in sweat. <laughs> and um, and the reason I think, it, you know, the funny part of it is when I when I really looked at it, the reason why I broke out in sweat. Is because I I liked it, and that scared me. You know, because the way I was raised, you don't like kneeling down and holding another man's hand. So it really scared me because it was enjoyable. You know, uh, because I knew this man cared for me, and that scared me. And and what we did is we read the third step together, and we got up and. About 10 minutes later, I left and I went home and I wrote an inventory. And what happened is my inventory was about five or six pages. And, and, and I finished the five or six pages. I said to myself, well, I hear people get up on the podium and say they wrote an inventory that was 90 pages long. And I felt this must be an inadequate inventory if I only wrote five pages. But I realized today it was not an inadequate. Because see, when one of my babies bring me a uh, one of their inventories of 90 pages, I give it back to them because I don't have time for 90 pages. And what I tell them to do is take it back, take out your ego, and bring me back about four or five pages. See, what happened when I wrote my inventory, and that's because I truly believe that, that I... See, the first three steps, I believe, have to come from within. And if you honestly take in your first three steps, you can write an inventory. This is my own opinion. Whatever I say is my own opinion. And my four or five pages had nothing to do with my drinking, had nothing to do with my drug abuse, had nothing to do with my criminal activity. Because, see, I can get on a podium and brag about that. Because that's bragging. You know, what it talked about, see, what my inventory talked about was that, I'll tell you a couple of things I wrote into it. And it's funny, the things I wrote into my inventory were things you know, we talk about, you know, you got to remember you are as sick as your secrets. And, and we, we, we've done things in our life that we say that we would never, I would die first before I let anybody know about this. You know, and it was things like, like when I was, my mother, when I first started getting off on the wrong track, and I come from a poor family back in Chicago, and my mom, a little bit of savings that she had, and she took me off the streets and put me into a military school, you know, so I was hoping that I wouldn't go off into the wrong way and with the wrong kids. And, and she put me in one of these schools that were, was a wealthy school, and, and I was the only guy in that whole school running around with one of the, one of the, we all had uniforms, and I had patches on my knees. I mean, I could have died, man. I was the only guy in that whole school, and I hated it, and I resented it. 
and I didn't know that. And that's what came out of my inventory. The another thing that came out of my inventory was, you know, when I was five years old. Now, when I give my ages, I don't really know if I was five, but I mean, I, I guess it was around that age. I was a little boy. And there was another kid next door to me that was about my age, and, and I lived in Chicago then, and we had we had these three-story buildings, and we had back porches and stuff, and and, uh, and there was a big box on my back porch, and, and me and this five-year-old kid was in this was in this uh, uh, these two little kids were in this big box, and what we were doing was we were fondling each other. Where we were at, we were five years old, six years old, wherever we were, and we were exploring. And my grandmother came out of the house and she caught us. And she screamed and told us how vile and ugly what we were doing was vile and ugly. And, and, and I really felt ashamed. You know, and, I, and I can remember, man, that I would never let this happen again. I would never let anybody know that that happened. Because I really believed I did something so bad. And here I was, you know, like 30 years later, still punishing that kid. And what I found out after I shared my inventory with my sponsor that I didn't do anything wrong. See, I believed that I had done something wrong, was so wrong that it could never be right again. And it wasn't wrong. See, I didn't do anything wrong. I just believed that it was wrong. And those, those are the kind of things that got to come out of my inventory, the things that I've been keeping a secret that I've been so ashamed of. You know, it's, it's, it's weird how, you know, when we talk about shame, we're so, you know, I got to, 18-month-old kid now that I hope I don't do this to. Uh, is that we're, you know, I, it's like, remember, when, I don't know, maybe you can identify with this little story. It's like when, when, you, when your son or, or he first finds his nose, you know, when you, you try to teach him things. This is nose, this is ear, this is eye, you know, this is lips or mouth. You know, and then all of a sudden one day he'll say to you, Mommy, ear. You know, and you, whoa, you know, you, you call up your, your mother and say, Look, his grandchild just found his ear. You know, everybody's so proud of that. You know, God, how wonderful! He found his ear. You know, look, he found his nose. You know, then one day, you know, he comes out, he's stark naked, and he's look, mommy, and then boy, they just get a towel and they wrap him up and they bring him into a room. You can't, you know, all of a sudden he, you know, it's shame, shame. You should do that. You know, and and all that kid did is five years old, six years old. He, you know, he found another part of himself. And what we do is we become shamed. We're not supposed to do that. Close the bathroom door when you go to the bathroom. Shame on you for leaving it open. Right? So you're brought up with a lot of things that you really think that, that you've done that you were horrible. Here you are, 40 or 50 years old, whipping on that little kid. And so what the inventory is supposed to do, I feel the inventory is supposed to do what it does for me. It starts freeing me of the things that I thought that were so horrible that had put me into a prison. That's what the inventory is for. You know, and uh, and then as you work the steps, you know, and if you and if you work, they're, they're numbered for a reason. They're they're numbered for intellectual people. They really are. <laughs> and, and and as the, as you work the steps, you know, it's like, I, you know, one of the reasons, another reason why I never wanted to get into the steps, because you, you hear them around the program once in a while. You know, like. Because people get up on the podium once in a while, they'll talk about a step that they're working, and you hear people talk about the amends step. And you say to yourself, God, there's no way in the world I can make amends to everybody I've heard. Yeah. And if I can't make amends to everybody in the world that I've done harm to, why should I do the steps? Yeah. And what we don't realize, the, the reason why we had the first three steps is to get into, to get into God's camp. Because what I find out, if you have the faith, you know, if you believe. And see, one of the things that I do know, God has an unlimited supply of money. You know, he does. And, and what he can do for you is that once you start making, you know, the decision to make the amends, you, and, and every time an amends comes up that you have to make, you'll be able to make it. That's why they say make a list. That's why we have a sense. Make a list of all the people that you have harmed and you need to make amends to. So you, what you do is you make that list out. Then God, in his wisdom, will in turn take the ones that you can make. He'll bring them right to you. He has a way of you bumping into the person and you have to make amends to you. <laughs> Try to avoid him. He'll bring them to you. Well, once you make the, <laughs> once you make the decision. 
you know, and, and it's like uh, the, the the prayer and meditation step was another one. You know, is that uh, I don't know how to meditate. You know, I thought that you had to learn yoga and you had to, uh, yeah, because my head's so busy. You know, I mean, I could never get my head to stand still. It just won't. You know, I, I it, it, it's constantly going. My, you know, I, I could. I don't have a radio in my car. I stole it twice, and so I haven't re re put one in. And people say, don't you miss your radio? I never listened to it anyway. I put it on, you know. <laughs> and then my head starts talking. Uh, so I don't really hear what's on the radio, you know. So, I, so what I realize is, is that, uh, you, know, I, you know, how do you pray and meditate? You know, and, and, and it really confused me. What I, what I realized, you know, because being intellectual, you know, is is really a killer around this camp. You know, and because what I found out, what prayer and meditation for me is, is a two way conversation with God. Prayer is me talking to Him, and meditation is Him talking to me. Well, see, I never had time for meditation. I get down in the morning. I used to talk about how, how good I was. I got up in the morning. I crawled out of bed. I got onto my knees. I prayed, and I went and took a bath <laughs> or a shower. You know, and it's like. What I did do is I got down, I did get on my knees, and I prayed, but I forgot to listen. You know, I had I had my say, and I never gave God a chance to talk. Yeah. You know, what I did, so what I would do is I would talk to him and hang up on him you know, and, and go take a shower. <laughs> and and, and I, what I realized today is, is meditation is listening. Even though my head is going 1,000 miles an hour, it's okay, he'll get in. And he's got that power to get in. You know, just as long as I can kneel there long enough. You know, it's hard to kneel there. Try it in the morning. You say you're present, just, just sit there. Or just kneel there. You start thinking about work. You start thinking about driving the work. You start thinking about... He'll get in. He will get in if you allow him to. You know, it's, and it's like uh, when you get to the 12-step you know, talks about, as a result of these steps, you will have a spiritual awakening. You know, and uh, uh, and I always thought a spiritual awakening was when you had your head on your chest, you know, just... At peace with yourself, knocked out. And uh, I was in my fourth year, and I was on an airplane coming back from San Diego to, to Los Angeles, and I, and uh, it was a, one of the fantastic weekends that I had. And I'm on this airplane, and I start getting this overwhelming feeling. I mean, like a feeling that I never had in my life. I mean, the feeling was so, and so intense that I wanted to get up and say, "Hey, I feel great." You know, you ever, you ever, I mean, I really wanted to get up there and tell people, God, I feel fantastic, you know, and, but I didn't do that. You know, I just went and had this, caught that feeling, and it was like a feeling that I never had. I never, I, booze and drugs had never taken me to that, to that place, never. You know, this was the ultimate high that I've ever had. You know, unfortunately, it doesn't stay, you know, it, but what, what I feel has happened is it was my, I feel that was my spiritual, one of my spiritual awakenings. And, and I feel what happened is that for the first time in my life that I felt that one with the universe. For the first time in my life, I felt important. You know, you know I felt like no matter how small or insignificant I may be, I helped make the world turn around. And I helped make this world function. Man. I'm a part of what's going on. Through this program, through the help of you people, I function out there. I do my bit every single day. You know, and 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 and, and see what what I believe happened. It, it, what this program has done. I'll give you an example. Is that uh, they said I can talk for a little extra because yeah, part of it is something. And Bill's not here. Uh, <laughs> I think what happens is that, you know, is that I'll give you an example. Is that there was about six of us standing in a circle one day, and uh, and there's, there's a guy by the name of Bob B down in L.A. and he's always he's a camera buff. He's always got cameras with him. He's always taking pictures. And one day he had this Polaroid, and the six of us standing around, he's looking at me. He took my picture, and the thing spit out, you know, and he waited for it to, you know, to develop, and and it developed. And he looked at it, and said, oh, this is pretty good, good picture. He said. And he passed it to the next guy, and this guy. Everybody gave a, 
uh, their opinion. Everybody says, God, yeah, that came out great. What a great picture, you know. You know, and it got to me, and I couldn't wait till it got to me, and I looked at it, and I went, <laughs> yeah, but uh, <laughs> look at the nose. And Bob B. said to me, you know what, no one is, that is your nose. And you better get to like it. <laughs> you know. and so, you know, it's like what the, so what the 12 Steps did for me is that, that I didn't want to be me. I always wanted to be someone else. You know, and so what I found out is that, you know what, my name is Nolan and I'm an alcoholic and I'm not going to be anything else but a Nolan. I'm not going to wake up one day and be Dick or Pete or Paul or Mary. I'm going to be Nolan every day I wake up. That means I better get to like him. So what the 12 steps does for you is introduce you to you. And, for, and, and, and when that good feeling I had on the airplane was for the first time in my life that my skin fit. I was 40-something years old, and all of a sudden, for the first time, I fit in my own skin. The greatest gift in the world, this program. The 12 steps will help you. It's like, it's like a tailor, tailor making a suit for you. And after you have your spiritual waiting, and all of a sudden you feel like, God, I'm all right. I'll never be him, or I'll never be this great or that great, but I'll always be no one. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with me. Do you know what? I don't have everything I would like. Yeah. But there's nobody in this world that I would rather be than me. Nobody. I don't care how much you got or how much you haven't got or who you got or who you haven't got. I don't want to trade with you. I really don't. I may want something you have, but I don't want to trade lives. I've got such a fantastic life today due to this program. Yeah. I, and there's times, you know, like, I'm still the same person. Another thing that it did for me, the 12 steps, is that I'm st I am Nolan. I, can't, I, I still have the same pains, the same hurts, the same feelings I had when I got here over 14 years ago. You know, I hurt just as bad as I did the first day I got here. And when I hurt, I hurt. The only difference today is I can tell you. I don't have to go through any pain alone anymore. And I refuse to go through pain alone anymore. If you're around, I'm dumping on you. I really am. You'll hear it. Yeah. If I'm hurting, I'll tell you I'm hurting. I don't want to talk about it, but I'll tell you I'm hurting. You know. Uh, but it's given me this freedom. It's given me a lot of freedom. It's given me. It's given me me. You know. And if you're new, you know, about four or five people have raised their hands and identified as newcomers. If you're new, don't wait three years to get into the steps because you may not make three years. I was very lucky, and I don't know why God allowed me to hang around this camp for three years before I got into the steps. Uh, and, I, and I know the steps work today. I really do, and I know what they can do for you. I, I, uh, I'll take another three minutes. What ha one of the things that, that I got in my life today is an 18-month-old boy. And uh, one of the things I have a problem with was I, don't, I have a problem with relationships. I cannot have a relationship or, or a meaningful relationship. I have not grown enough in that area. And, uh, and the reason for that is, is because I, I don't know how to make that total commitment. You know, it's really funny. I want that total commitment, but I don't know how to do it. So God in his wisdom, you know, with my last relationship, uh, he gave me an 18-month-old, he gave me a not he was an 18-month-old, he was. <laughs> but he gave me a son. And uh, even though Susie and I were separated, I, I went to Lamaze classes with her, man, and I, and I was in the operating room when she had her C-section, and, and I saw the baby born, and, and uh, the first time I had real tears in my eyes. And uh, there were tears of joy. I saw, I saw a, a human being born. I mean, it was just, you know what? It's like I had two previous children with another wife. 
I wasn't there each time when they were born. I always took it for granted. You, you, you met a woman, you, you went to bed, you made love, and nine months later there was a child. I never realized the miracle that was taking place. I had no idea that inside her body was another human being taking form. We had this book that every month told you exactly where the baby was at. He had arms this month, he had hands this month, you know, he, he had a brain, and, and, and then he'd feel his first heartbeat. You know, and I used to get from my, my ear by her stomach and I'd hear that heartbeat. And, and, uh, and I used to talk to him. We, I knew, she took a test where I knew it was a boy and we had named him already. And I, and I talked to him, I said, Garrett, hurry up, we'll go skiing together and we'll do this. <laughs> and, 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 he, and he was born and, and, and uh, you know what? I've made my first total commitment. I fell in love for the first time in my life. And, I, and, and it's funny, I said to somebody that I want to teach this kid everything I know. And the guy said to me, Nolan, you cannot teach this kid nothing. That kid can teach you if you allow him. And you know, I'm in love so much that I give my son every other weekend. I get him every Wednesday. Those are our days. There is nothing in this world that, that will take him from me those days. I, uh, I want to be with him. I enjoy him. I, I, I enjoy changing his diapers. I mean, sometimes he'll shit all over, man. <laughs> I enjoy cleaning it up. I love him that much. There's nothing in the world that I would not do for this boy. And, and I, what I'm realizing today, that it's the first time in my life that I have ever made the total commitment. And that I know today that one day, I don't know when, but I'll be able to have a meaningful relationship with a woman. Someday I'll be able to make that full commitment to another human being. And I know I'll be able to do that. Because, see, I'm allowing this boy, to teach my son, to teach me. And he's the best teacher that came along in all the years I've been around. I love this kid so much. And what I'm saying to you is that because I hung in here and I hung in here and I hung in here through whatever I had to go through, you know, my, I think that... Uh, Dave talked about it, that uh, he had a fantastic year. I had a fantastic 14 and a half years. You know, I had not, never had a total bad day in this program. You know, and no matter how much pain or how sick I got. But it's hanging in here. You've given me everything. You've gave me my life, and you gave me my son, and I thank you dearly. Thank you.